Okay, so now let's talk about uh, pulse oximetry, which is a way you can measure your how oxygenated your blood is, and that's really important because if if you're not doing well, if you're if you're sick or critically ill, then your ability to oxygenate goes down substantially. So you can measure this, and it's a great way to tell if someone's uh, how someone's recovering from a from an accident, injury, or a disease, or just general general health is your body's ability to oxygenate blood. So this week you'll grab a pulse ox measurement thing from the storage bin and try it, and you'll read oxygen level and heart rate. But let's tell you how it works. So maybe we can maybe measure absorption differences to get oxygen level in the blood, okay? Because we already talked about the fact that hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin have different absorption profiles, okay? So if here's uh, oxygenated hemoglobin, it's going to look more red, right? Whereas deoxygenated homo hemoglobin is what gives your color a blue, your blood a more of a blue color. Okay. So, how can we account though for the, the confounding effects that you know you don't even know the path length that you're measuring through? You put something on your finger, you're going to measure the finger length, and then all the other things that are in the way, such as skin and tissue. This makes it really difficult. And so when you measure these things, you typically have to measure things in terms of different units. And I'll, I'll go through these just really briefly. And a warning, this is how chemists do things. This is not engineers. So there's some strange units here. And so you measure things like absorbance, which has no units, which is comprised of the molar absorptivity, the molarity or concentration, moles per centimeter squared. Remember, one mole is Avogadro's number there, right? And also the path length. But we don't know the path length, you know, unless you're going to measure the thickness of your finger or how deep the light's going in each time. The other term is absorption or, t or attenuation coefficient. We already know that. We've talked about that before, alpha, right? And that was the how quickly these exponentially fall off in intensity due to absorption was. And that's just the molar absorptivity times the concentration, the molarity or concentration, okay? So this is a plot here of molecular absorptivity. This is a plot of this versus wavelength, okay, for the oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. So here's the key point. The absorption, absorbance and absorption coefficients are proportional to the concentration of absorbers. And so if you have more deoxygenated blood, then you should see a change in the total absorption signal, right? This makes sense. So think about this. Being proportional, that's a key point, okay? The absorption is proportional to the concentration, see? This is proportional to this. This is proportional to this. This concentration is key because we want to calculate concentrations to figure out how much of the blood is oxygenated versus deoxygenated. So here's an example. If I have one sheet with X amount of dye in it and it transmits 40% of the light and I stack two sheets, I would transmit 16% of the light. 40% for the first one and 40% of 40% for the second one resulting in 16% after you get through the second one, okay? Well, when you did that, the light saw double the number of dye molecules because you put two sheets in series, right? I could have therefore just made one sheet with twice the amount of dye and I would get the exact same calculation. And so then we can use this to start extracting calculations because we don't need things like path length, right? If we can get both of these, we can start to eliminate some variables like path length with, that we don't know. So, the total absorption in the blood will be the sum of the absorbance, absorbance of the oxygenated and deoxygenated. So this basically says the total absorbance will be the sum of the oxygenated, there's the concentration, and the deoxygenated, there's the concentration and the path length. Now, what I can do is I can go to this isobestic point here where the curves overlap, right here. That's where essentially the 0% and the 100% concentration plots will exactly overlap. At this point, we know the molar absorptivities are the same. So I can, instead of having uh, epsilon ox and epsilon deox, I can just have one epsilon, pull it out, and now I've simplified down my variable. See how we're, we're kind of simplifying this complicated thing down? But I'm still left with path length, and so how do I basically reduce the variables further? And, you know, deal with skin pigmentation, size, path length, how it's placed, etc. Well, a commercial pulse oximeter uses two wavelengths, typically 660 nanometers and 940, so there's 660 and 940. And what they'll do is at this point, they'll look at the ratio between 
the two points here between the oxygenated and the they would expect in a lookup table and then they'll measure the actual where it should be and they'll look at the ratio of these two measurements here so what's this versus this then they have a lookup table knowing where the spread should be and then they can predict as a result the concentration of oxygenated versus deoxygenated so hence that's why they use two wavelengths so you can see it's, a, it's basically to summarize briefly it's an exercise in reducing as many variables as you can through as, you know doing things like multiple wavelength measurements and measuring at the white right wavelengths as well so one other thing you can do in pulse oximetry is you can get rid of a lot of the background signals so if you imagine you're trying to measure blood but what about all the signal from tissue and, and things like that how do you remove that well if I measure I've had, this is a pulse ox here and I'm here's my finger that's what that's supposed to be at least if I measure it, I've got skin, I've got blood, I basically get blood, which is an AC signal, right? Because it's being pumped in and out by the heart. I've got blood, a DC signal. Some of it, you know, there's always some blood in parts of tissue, tissue that pumps slowly, so it doesn't change much with time. And then I've got tissue, which is always there, which is the DC signal. So if I basically focus on just the time varying component, which would be just the blood that's pumping in and out as your heart rate changes, I can therefore subtract out optical signal from the tissue and get a better reading. Okay, so the AC signal from the heart rate is only about 2%. 90% is 98% is DC, which is all this background tissue. This optically measured AC bud signal is also called a PPG, where you can measure the blood essentially pumping in and out and get heart rate and things like from that, get heart rate and things like that from it as well. So Here's an example of, of measuring pulse ox of someone that's healthy versus someone that has sleep apnea. That's where you're basically, your breathing drops down and then you find your body's too deoxygenated and then you start breathing like crazy to kind of, to wake yourself up. So this is the oxygenation level, okay? And this is respiration measured here. This is a normal, normal healthy person, nice and oxygenated blood, nice breathing cycles you can see here, nice and even. Someone with sleep apnea, the oxygenation level goes down because they're not breathing. Then all of a sudden, they, their body realizes they need oxygen, so they start breathing like crazy. And it comes back up, then it goes down, then they start breathing like crazy. So they basically get really poor sleep, and this is very poor on your health. Okay, review, take a break, and we are almost done.